This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, good morning, Rabbi Isai. Baruch HaMabam to the Kala Igor de Perka here in Kugarn Hills, New York. So we have a good one today. Parashas Boy. Mazel tov to all the people who came today and didn't stay home. Okay, so, and also to the Bali Simcha. The, um, the parasha tells us that, that um, the first mitzvah in the Torah, the mitzvah that Rashi would have liked the Torah to begin with, Hachodesh Hazel Lachem, Roish Chodoshim, Rishon Hu Lachem, Lachod Shei Hashana. And we know that we have given names to the months of the year, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tamoz, and some of them are rather uh, strange because they're names of Persian gods like Tamoz. And why in the world would we adopt the names of uh, Avodah Zara and Persian gods and use it for our names of the year? And the Ramban is troubled by this question because uh, these are not of Jewish etymology. The names of the Jewish months are not of Jewish origin. So why have we adopted the non-Jewish months? Especially one of the reasons we were... Uh, we had this chus to leave Mitzrayim as shaloi shinu es We did not change, the, the, our change the language. So why would we use the uh, Persian names of the months for our months? And um, the Ramban in par- this week's parsha, parsha Perak Yud Beis Pasuk Beis, Ukfar Hiskiru Rabbi Seinu Zeha Inyan. Our Chachamim have mentioned this. For Amru and they said, Shemois Chadashim Alu Imanu Mi Babel. The names of the months came up with us from Babel. Why? Ki mitchila, because at first, loy hayu lahem shemois etzleinu. These, we didn't have names. We called it the first month, the second month, the third month, the fourth month. But we did not have names for all 12 months, or even for most of them. Avel kasher alinu, alinu mi Babel. But when we came out of Babel, chazarnu likroi hachadashem, we reverted to call the names of the months B'Shem Shenikram B'Aretz Babel in the names that they called them in Babylon. Why? That's what the Ramban is bothered by. Why would we call the names of the months by Babylonian names? Says so Ramban Lahazkir to remember Kisham Amadnu that there we stayed Umisham He'elanu Hashem Yisbach and Hashem brought us out of there. Ki Eila Hashem Ois Nisan Iyar Vezulasan Shemois Parsiyam They are Persian names V'lo Yimsa Rak Besifre Nivie Babel Uve Megillas Esther You will not find them in the books of Tanakh You will not find anywhere in Chumash any reference to the names of the months that we have today not In none of the parishes of the Torah does it refer to as Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, and Tamas Even in the Nevi'im Rishayim they are not referred to as those names The only Sfarim um, that you have Chodesh HaRishaynu Chodesh Nisan Bechodesh You'll find in Megillah Sester, which of course was uh, written in, in Persia. And you'll find it in the Nevi'e Babel, like uh, the Navi um, Ezra Nechemia, like in Ezra Nechemia. Who, who's he referring to as they in Babel? What? Who's he referring to as they in Babel? Who in Babel called them by his name? The Babylonians. The Babylonians. This, these are uh, Babylonian names. Why were they referring to... What would they refer to the Hebrew months? They have their own calendar. A month is a month. In other words, they have a lunar calendar, and the month begins when the when the moon is born, and the month is over when the the cycle is over. So also have like in English. They went by lunar calendar. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the Chinese New Year. I don't know about the Chinese New Year, but uh, the, the Muslim calendar is purely lunar, is only lunar. The, uh, our, the American calendar is a solar calendar. It's primarily lunar, but we, we balance it in order to keep Pesach into the uh, spring. But it's, it's really a lunar calendar that's balanced based on the seasons. Okay, so this is a question. What, what's the meaning of this? Why did the Chachamim want us to remember that we came out of Bavel? What is the significance, uh, significance of that? Why is that so important? Why would that justify calling the names of the month by Persian names? Uh, and this is a question that Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky asks in uh, the Emes Yaakov, in Parshas Boy. Uh, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky was one of the favorite Talmidim of the altar of Sabotka. He held many important uh, rabbinic posts as well before he became the Roshiva of Tarvadas in, I believe, 1948. 
He lived from 1891 to 1986. So Rabbi Yaakov wants to know, Vihine Yesh Why did they forsake the language of the Chumash and use the Persian language? Especially the names of the month which of our which are of uh, idolatrous origin, for example, Tammuz. Now, we know another very interesting thing. During the times of the second Beis HaMikdash, the spoken language among the Jewish people was Aramaic. Aramaic. So that's another question. Why, when the Jewish people, they came back to Eretz Yisrael in, um, in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash, they didn't speak Lashon HaKodesh in Eretz Yisrael. It's like people want to know, you know, should I go to Eretz Yisrael? Okay, yeah. But are, are, we, are they going to give? Are they going to speak in English there? No, you can't. Of course not. You go to Eretz Yisrael, you speak Lashon Hakodesh. Why would you speak in English? You know, what, what would the point be? But um, the, 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 the Jews returned to the second base Hamikdash, and they did not speak Lashon Hakodesh. In fact, they forgot Lashon Hakodesh. They continued to speak Aramaic. So here it is in Mitzrayim, one of the reasons why they were redeemed is and during the times of the second Beis HaMikdash, what happened? Klal Yisrael, during the times of the second Beis HaMikdash, Klal Yisrael continued to speak Aramaic. Why did they do that? So that's another point that we have to try to understand. First of all, why did they continue to call the names of the months Babylonian names? Why did the Jews, when they returned to Eretz Yisrael, why did they stop speaking Lashon HaKodesh? So regarding this question, we'll call it uh, a second question. The, there's an interesting comment of the Chassam Soifer. The Chassam Soifer writes um, regarding a very interesting halacha. We know that in a Beis HaKisei, in a place where there's filth, in a place where there's soya, you're not allowed to learn, you're not, you're not even allowed to think in learning. The question is, are you allowed to say Hebrew words? In other words, does the Hebrew language have Kedusha, or do we say only Torah has Kedusha, but the language itself is uh, Chulen? So interesting, uh, the Shochanach Paskins and Simon Pehe, Sif Beis, that Afilu Lahar Har Bedivrei Torah Osr Beveis HaKisei, Ubeveis HaMerchatz, but says the Shochanach, Dvarim Shal Choyol Mutter La'imram Sham Belashen HaKodesh. Secular speech, discretionary speech, you're allowed to say in in Lashon HaKodesh, in the Beis HaKisei. Says the Magen Avram, Umidas Chasidus Hu Lachachmer. It is Umidas Chasidus not to speak Lashon HaKodesh in the Beis HaKisei. Okay. Says the Chassam Soifer, based on this Magen Avram, that it's Umidas Chasidus not to speak Lashon HaKodesh in the Beis HaKisei. What about in an area where there are Avod Zara? In other words, we say there's a concept... Technically, you're allowed to speak Lashon HaKodesh in a Beis HaKisei. What about where there's Avodah Salilam? What about if there's Avodah Zara? So the Chassam Soifer says, The Huadin, the Makam Gilulam. The same halach would apply if they're Avodah Zara. It's preferred not to speak Lashon HaKodesh. Says the Chassam Soifer, Now I understand why when the Jews returned in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash, they did not speak Lashon HaKodesh. You know why? Because they forgot it. They literally forgot how to speak Lashon HaKodesh. Why did they forget it? Because they went down to Babel. And Babel, we know, is Mole Avoidas Alilam. Babel is full of idols. So in Babel, they, were, they didn't have the opportunity to speak in Lashon HaKodesh because they were careful with this Mug in Avram not to speak Lashon HaKodesh in a Beis HaKisei or in a Makayim Avoidas Zara. So it says, Chsam Soifer, Venir Ali, to Mishem Hachi Hiniya. That's why in ancient times the custom was not to speak Lashon HaKodesh because it was a, it, there were Avodah Zara everywhere. It was completely forgotten from us. Okay, so that's the shot of the Chassam Soifer. But it's something that Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky wonders about and that is why when the Jewish people returned in this time of the second base Hamikdash, did they stop speaking Lashon Hakodesh? In Egypt, maybe they weren't a machmer like the Magen Avram, right? <laughs> the Torah wasn't given yet, so you want to say, you know, the Torah wasn't given. The same argument. Yeah, the, the, there there was no Torah, so they didn't even have to keep the mitzvahs. In fact, they didn't keep the mitzvahs. 
So if they didn't keep the mitzvahs, uh, so it, it's unusual. But one thing they did keep is they they shalei shino es l'shanim. Okay. Did they learn the chumash every week? What? Did they learn chumash every week? Chumash every week? No, they were oved avod zara. How they learning chumash every week? They were oved avod zara. They fell to. Okay. No, how do you have Yiddishkeit without a Torah? They were empty and bare. Okay, right there, Rabbi Isai. So this is a few, a few interesting points. Namely, why did they adopt the uh, Persian names of the month? Why in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash did they stop speaking Lash Nakaynesh? How come you the Gemara you have Talmud Bavli? What? If they didn't know if they were going to Avodah Zohar, how did you get Talmud Bavli? Talmud Bavli wasn't written in Mitzrayim. No, I'm talking about in Bavim. So it's an Aramaic. Well, it's Aramaic, because everything was done. Yeah, correct. So how, did they, how can you say that they were walking out with the Zara? In Mitzrayim, they were walking out with the Zara. Oh, you think you said in Bavim? No. Oh. Oh. In Bavim. Okay. So what? Does not Aramaic also have a level of Kedusha? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No. Wait, but uh, there's no halacha, you know, to speak Aramaic in the Beis HaKisei. Right. In fact, uh, some Sofer writes in his Chedushim on uh, Chulen that the reason for Shnai Mikro Vecha Targum right. is Targum is uh, Davar Tomei. And Mamela we do twice in Lashna Kodesh and once in Targum between Mavatel, the Tuma of Aramaic, some Sofer writes. The Targum Onkulos was given on Sinai. Yeah, Targum Onkulos was Nimsar Sinai. But the, the language, Lachaira itself doesn't have uh, Kedusha. Okay. Rabbi Yisai, we're going to see a lot of very interesting things. Okay, Rabbi Yisai, in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash, they were missing a number of things that they had in the times of the first Beis HaMikdash. It says, the Navi Chagai says, V'eretza v'ikavda. And it's spelled, v'ikaved without a hey. So the Gemara Numa Darshans, these are the five things that they had in the first Beis HaMikdash that they did not have in the second Beis HaMikdash. What were they? The Eish, the Urim Betumim, the Shechina and Ruach HaKodesh was not present in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash. But most notably, but what they didn't have in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash was the Arain. The Arain was not extant in the time of the second Beis HaMikdash. So you'll ask, where was it? So the simple answer is that Yoshio HaMelech, a hundred years before, Yoshio HaMelech took the Arain and he hid it that a hundred years before destruction of the first base of Mikdash. And they didn't know where it was. In other words, you ask most people, where was the Ara in the times of the second base of Mikdash? They'll say, we don't know. Yoshio put it in the underground labyrinths that Shema Melech made of the first base of Mikdash. The problem is, asked Rabbi Yaakov, there is a Mishnah in Shkalem. And the Mishnah goes as follows. There's a story with a Kayin who was doing Avoid in the base of Mikdash. And he saw one of the floor panels of the base of Mikdash was a little bit out of place. And he wanted to tell his friend, oh, look at that, maybe that's where the Aroin was, and he died. Meaning, what do we see from here, says Rabbi Yaakov, that they knew exactly where the Aroin was in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash. So I asked Rabbi Yaakov, so why didn't they take it out and put it in the Kodesh HaGdashim where it belongs? So in the meaning until today, everybody would have gone their whole life thinking that they didn't know where the Arain was. But that could not be farther from the truth. They knew exactly where it was. They knew to the millimeter, they knew to the inch where the Arain lay under which floor plan. They obviously deliberately left it there and did not remove it and put it in the Kodesh HaKadosh where it belonged. Why? Why didn't they put the Aron where it belonged? After all, the whole Kedusha of the Beis HaMikdash emanated from the Aron. It's called Mishkan Ha'edos. The Eidos because of the Luchai. So they knew where the Aron was. Why didn't they put the Aron back? Asks Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. Here's the real whopper. So, so far we're reading the Emes Yaakov on Parshas Boy. Now let's go to the Emes Yaakov on Parshas Shemais. And there's a Pasuk in Shemais, Perak Gimel, Pasuk Yud Ches. The Pasuk says like this. V'shamu l'koy lecha. Rivan Shem tells Moshe, don't worry, they will listen to you. Uvasan, you'll come, Ata, Zikne Yisrael. You'll come with the Zikainim, El Melech Matrayim. Vamar Temelov, you'll say to him, Hashem Alekeho Ivriyim, Nikra Aleinu. The Rivan Shem happened to appear to us. Biata, and now, Nelchana. Let us go, Derech Shloishas Yamim, Ba Midbar, a three day journey in the Midbar, 
V'nizbechal Hashem Lekein. And bring Karbanos to our God. Ask of Yaakov Kamenetsky. There's a Bula Misa. <laughs> Three days in the Midbar, huh? Never happened. Lehayav alay nivra. What kind of Misa... Is Moshe Rabbeinu supposed to spin to Parai? Parai, just let us go for three days. What are you talking about, three we days? We coming back. Well, you know, we're, st- we're still on that three-day sabbatical <laughs> that Moshe Rabbeinu told Parai, let's just go for three days. We know, Chaysam <laughs> Yishal HaKadosh Baruch MS. If the Yibar wants to take us out, he, he doesn't have to trick Parai. What, what is this? What's Moshe Rabbeinu supposed to tell Parai? Why is Hashem telling Moshe, tell Parai, let us go for three days? You ever what? It's a Pasuk in Chumash. You ever wonder about this? What's going on over here? Neil Chana Darak Shlosh says, Yamim. What's going on? What is Moshe Abeno telling Parai? That's another question. So, so far, we wanted to know about the months of the year. We want to know why the Jews stopped speaking Lashon HaKodesh in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash. Why didn't they put the Arain back? And four, we want to know what, what is this Baba Misa that it seems like Moshe Abeno is spinning off, pawning off to Parai. Another question, Rabbi Say. The Ramban in Parshas Vayichi says that in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash, in the times of Hanukkah, so the Chashmonam restored Jewish sovereignty, but they took it a step further. They decided to appoint a king from the Chashmonam. And because they did so, they violated the tzava of the Zakein Yaakov Avinu. They violated Yaakov's ethical will. Yaakov Avinu said, Layasur Shevet Mi Yehuda. And therefore they were punished, that the Chashmam were wiped out. And that's why today the Gemara says, anyone who says they come from the Chashmanam is a liar. All the Chashmanam were wiped out to a man. Why? Because the Chashmanam violated Layasur Shevet Mi Yehuda. So as for Yaakov Kamenetsky, they were rabbis back then, right? I mean, we're talking, we're talking in the time of the second day, Samikdash. You know, why didn't the rabbis get together and say, you koyhanim, you're a bunch of rishonim. You're violating the, uh, you're violating the Pasuk and the Chumash. You, do you know what the repercussions could be? Why didn't the Rabbanon get up and speak out and have a protest and gather everybody together and say, we can't have this. We need to appoint a melech from Shevet Yehuda from Machos Beis David. Why did the rabbis... Um, countenance this. Why did they allow this? Why did they agree? Why did they endorse this? Why didn't they speak up? Ask Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. Another question, Rabbi Isai. A lot of questions. You ever open up um, Talmud Yushalmi? Talmud Yushalmi was written where? In Eretz Yisrael. It was written by rabbis, Orthodox rabbis, <laughs> who were Tamid Chachamim, and they probably knew Lashon HaKodesh. So why in the world did they write it in Aramaic? You want to say Talmud Bavli, which was written in Babel, was written in Aramaic. Okay, that I understand. That's the language that everybody spoke there. That's the language of the country. Why in the world are Rabbanim, are Tamid Chachamim, writing Talmud Yushami in Aramaic? And it's a very difficult Aramaic. It's a very hard Aramaic. It's harder than Talmud Bavli. Why would you write Talmud Yushalmi in Aramaic? What's the point of doing that? What's the logic of that? You look at the names of the Tanoim and Amoran. Abaye, Ravdimi, Ravini, Ravina, Papa, Tarfain. What? These are not Hebrew names. Horkinus. Yeah. Horkinus. Horkinus. Rabasi. These are not Hebrew names. Why would Tanoim and Amoram not call themselves like Avraham, Yitzchak, Aaron? Hebrew names. One of the reasons why we were redeemed from Mitzrayim is Shaloy Shinu S. Shemam, they didn't change their names. And here, the Tanoim and Amaram, Kemat, all of them, they don't have Hebrew names. They all have Aramaic names. Why would they use Aramaic names? What's the meaning of that? It's a very, uh, very unusual uh, phenomenon we have over here. If you open up your Tanakhs, we have... What? Those were Amoras you just cited. And sometimes now I'm... So they were Babylonians. Yeah, but why would they use uh, 
why would they use Babylonian names? The reason why we were exiled from Egypt is because they didn't use Egyptian names. That was their zchus. Their zchus was they didn't change their names. So why would the tzaddikim na Moram, who had religious freedom, they could have called themselves any name they wanted, why would they use Aramaic names? Well, at their bris, why did their parents say, Vikarsh Ma'i Yisrael Ashi, Ravina, Abaye, why wouldn't their parents call them Hebrew names? What's very unusual is if you look in uh, the Tanakh, you'll notice there are two Nevi'im. There's a Navi Yecheskel and there's a Navi Chagai. And the Navi Yecheskel primarily is a prophecy about what? The third Beis HaMikdash, the future, the Achras HaYamim. The Navi Chagai is a prophecy of the return in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash. Isn't that out of order? The Navi Yecheskel came first. Navi Yecheskel lived in the times of the first Beis HaMikdash. He's prophesying about the third Beis HaMikdash. And the Navi Chagai, who lived at the end of the first, during the 70 years, he's prophesying about the second. Why would God have the prophets prophecy out of order, where the Navi Yecheskel is prophesying about the third Beis HaMikdash, and the Navi Chagai is prophesying about the second Beis HaMikdash? What's the meaning of that? Okay, so Rabbi Yisai, I refer you to the following Pasuk. Parshas Boy, which is this week's Parsha, Perak Yod Aleph, Pasuk Aleph. The Pasuk says like this. Perak Yod Aleph, Pasuk Aleph. Vayoyimar Hashem El Moshe, Oid Nega Echod Ovi Al Paroi V'Al Mitzrayim. I have one more plague to bring. Acharechein, afterwards. Yishalach Escha Mizeh. I'm going to send you out of here. Kishalachoy, when I send you out, Kala, Gorish, you Gorish, Eschamiza. Kala, what does Kala mean? Gemira, Rashi says. Kalil, Kulchem, all of you. What, what does that mean? Listen to this. Vayoy mer Hashem el Moshe. Oy nega echod ovi al paroi vi al mitzrayim. Achrechen yishalach Eschamiza. Kishalachoy, Kala, Gorish, you Gorish, Eschamiza. Kala! What's Kala? All of you. As opposed to what? As opposed to only Shevet Zvulan? What's Kala? So, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky presents his major thesis, which is a concept that he presents in a number of places, in Parshas Boy, in Parshas Shemois, in Parshas Vayechi, in his commentary to Perkei Avois, and in many of his footnotes in the Sefer. And the way I want to introduce it is with the words of Rabbi Yonis and Ibishitz. Rabbi Yonis and Ibishitz in the Yaris Devash asks another question. So we have something like ten questions. The good news is there's only one answer. Okay? <laughs> the Rabbi Yonis and Ibishitz asks like this. Who was worse off? Who sinned greater? With all the with all the Sfarim and all the videos and all the Chafetz Chaim Heritage Foundation material, who sinned worse? The people in Bayis Rishon or the people in Bayis Sheni? Bayis Rishon, they killed, they committed adultery, and they served Abba Yisrael. Bayis Sheni, when their friend got uh, Ravi, uh, Shlishin, they got Ravi, they got into a little squabble. So who's worse? I mean, you could spin it however you want. Avaydezara, Gilarai, Shvichas Damim. Those are the big three. Sinas Chinam, you know, is relatively minor. And yet, after they were a bunch of murderers in Bayes Rishain, basically Hashem sent them into Galas, and they came right back. You had people who literally left the land who came back to Eretz Yisrael. Those same Chevra, the Reitzchim, the Menachim, the Oivdei Avaydezara, they made it back to the land. And the guys who didn't like the people, who, you know, whose yarmulke was a little bit different than theirs, were still in Gaulas 2,000 years. I mean, how, does that, how do you fit that? So I know, I know Sinaschinim is equal to all three, but <laughs> look, the big three are the big three. It's not fear. Ask the Rubiana Sinai Bishitz. Here it is, they sinned worse, and we're suffering for the Bayes Rishon sin. And the ones who suffer, who sin, the Bayesheni, who sinned rather minorly, they're the ones suffering, and the ones who sinned by Yisrishon, they came back. So, says Rabbi Yonis and Ibishetz, 
how many Batei Mikdashim are there in the entirety of the Jewish people? Really, there are only two. There's Bayis Rishain and there's Bayis Shlishi. What's Bayis Shani? So if you look in the Lashon of the Navi Yermia, we find like this. The Navi Yermia says, Ki lefi melois lebavel shivim shana. Who remembers the next words? Ki lefi melois lebavel shivim shana. Efgoid eschem neum Hashem. What does Efgoid mean? I'll remember you. It doesn't say Egal eschem, I'll redeem you. It says, I'll remember you. It's a pekida. You know what pekida means? A visit. A visit. Mashal mahadavar doyman. You have somebody, he spent his youth in yeshiva, and now he's out in the workplace. And you know what? He doesn't feel the same sanctity that he did when he was in the four walls of the Beis HaMedrash. So they have today these things, Yarchei Kala. So what's Yarchei Kala? You go for a day or two or for a weekend to a hotel, and you hear shiurim, the whole Shabbos, from big people, and you, so to speak, recharge your batteries so that you could go back out into the world with more of a with more of a feeling of attachment to the Torah, with more of a sanctified outlook. They just had an Eretz Yisrael. They had an Eretz Yisrael, right? There's such a concept, Yarchei Kala. You're not going back into the yeshiva. You're, you're, you've done, you're done with that stage in life. But you're, you're trying to reconnect to the sanctity that you once had, and now you have a different obligation in life. <laughs> Says Rabbi Yonis and Ibeshitz, the Jewish people, when they sinned in the times of the first base of Mikdash, they were in hot water. They were in such hot water that you know how long they needed to be in Gullahs for? For 2,000 years plus. But there was a problem. And the problem was they didn't really have the Tar Shabbat Peh. So for example, at the end of the 70 years, the Jewish people came back to Eretz Yisrael. They didn't know what a sukkah was. They didn't know what Shabbos was. They didn't know what it meant that you have to marry a Jew. So you had Jews coming back in time saying, listen, Mikdash, they didn't, sukkah, what's a sukkah? Shabbos? It's a chumrah. Chitun? You're allowed to marry a guy, what's so bad? I'm an Amoyev, it's all in the family anyway. And most of the Jews intermarried. Right? In times of Ezra, Malachi, he had to take care of the intermarriage. You think intermarriage today is a problem? It sure is. It is. You know what the intermarriage rate is today? It's over 70%. In 2017. That means out of every 10 Jewish weddings, every three times you're going to Chinka, or, right, or some other place in Borough Park to a wedding, you should know somewhere in the world another seven Jews are marrying out of their faith. But this is not the only time we had intermarriage problem. In the times of Ezra, in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash, in the beginning, the Jews were disappearing at an alarming rate. So what the Yvon Shem had to do was, even though after Chorben Bayis Rishon we needed to be in Golas for, for until the Gulach Reina, but the Yvon Shem realized what he needs to do is he needs to visit us. He needs to inject us with Kedusha for us to be able to last the Golas. And therefore he gave us a 420 year reprieve with the building of the second Mesa Mikdash. Was that a Geula? Absolutely not. It was not a redemption. That Beis HaMikdash did not have Ruach HaKodesh, it did not have the Shechina, God wasn't there. It was a temporary reprieve, it was a recharge of their batteries. During those 420 years, the Torah Shabbat Peh expanded. They made a decree, you can't eat the bread of a guy. They made a decree, you can't eat the oil of a guy. They made rabbinic decrees to prevent the Jewish people from intermarriage. The, all the Dinim Durabanon came into effect, not in Bayez Rishon, Bayez Shani. Without Dinim Durabanon, the Jewish people disappear immediately. They disappeared so fast, they basically forgot the language. They forgot Hebrew. They didn't speak Hebrew anymore. When the Jews went to Bavel, in one and two generations, we were about to disappear Chas Hashem forever. So the Yibam Shalom gave us second base HaMikdash, not as Geula, as Pekida, as a remembrance. And this is something that's brought in many, many Sfarim, and this is the concept that Rabbi Yonis and Ibeshitz brings down over here. Look at number 10, um, on the 1, 2, 3, 4, the fifth line. Aval Kfar Mavur Bechol Mikrois Tanach. It's already explicit. In all of the Pesukim of Tanakh, Ki Geula Bebayi Sheni Hoi Sarak Pekida. 
It was only a remembering. Aval arichos hagolos hamora hazois kvar nechta malenu begolos bayis rishon. The golos we're in today had already been signed, sealed, delivered when the first base hamikdash was destroyed. And if you look in the next paragraph of Rav Yenison Ibishetz, aval emes hikach. What was the purpose of remembering us after 70 years and then exil- exiling us again? But says Rabbi Anasin Ibishitz, the purpose of the second base Hamikdash was to preserve the Jewish people. Kfar Noida, during Bayes Rishon, because of the Roy Vaziva Satar, because of the great. Defecting from the Torah, ulamio takanoi sugdarum misan hedjin. You had very few dinim derabanan kemat nishkacha hatayra me'amoy neyam. The average person forgot the Torah kemat, and when they returned from the galus, lo yadu mi mitzas sukkah umishmir shabbos. We didn't share Shabbos. We, they forgot Shabbos. They, they, they didn't look at the Aron Kodesh. They have the, the, the Ten Commandments there somewhere, right? They look over there. All uh, right, the fifth one. Uh, it's the where is it? <laughs> it's the fourth one. Zochas Yom Shabbos Lekadsha, right? Here it says the fifth one. Yeah, yeah. That's how much they forgot, yeah. <laughs> right? And they mixed up among the goyim, and they didn't know that they didn't. Like he says, "V'lo yadu isurchiton." They didn't know you can't marry a guy. They they just thought, you know, my my parents always told me, you go off to school. Just one thing I ask you: don't marry a shiksa. That's what they thought it was. Ovefrad amanu moiv kimavur benechemia. So the Rebbeinu Shalom was Choshev Machshava Yisrael Yidach Mimenu Nidach. He gave us the second base Hamikdash not as a Geula but as a Pekida. Ah, so says Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. Based on this concept, all of these questions become very clear. And that is, look, in, look back at number nine. One answer to all these. Questions. One answer to all these ten questions. Let's let's ha- let's go through it. Says Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. Look at number nine. Sha oile bavel, shabanu as habayas hashenu, the oile bavel built the same as the mikdash, yadu kiloi ze habin yashayam el olamim. They knew as they built the second base of mikdash, they knew this building would not stand forever. And they were not returning to Eretz Yisrael as a geula. It was not a destination, it was only a station. And their opinion was that the purpose of Bayashini was to prepare them and to pave the way to preserve them in the Galas. And had Klal Yisrael gone straight from Churim Bayas Rishon, straight into Galas, there is no question, says Rabbi Yaakov, we would have disappeared as a, as a nation. So they built the second day Samikdash to be mechazik us and to instill in us the Gezeros Rabbanan. But in order to emphasize the idea that the second base Hamikdash was not a Geula, yes, they knew where the Aron was. They intentionally did not put the Aron back so that Klai Yisrael realizes this is not a real base Hamikdash. This is not the base Hamikdash of the Bayis Rishon. This is not the base Hamikdash of the Bayis Shlishi. This is a temporary Yarche Kala, so to speak. This is just an injection of Kedusha to last us through the Galas. And therefore, says Rabbi Yaakov, the Oile Bavel were Noyheg as if they were still in Golas. And what did they do? Therefore, when they returned to Eretz Yisrael, they continued to call the names of the month, the Babylonian and the Persian names, so that they should realize they're not redeemed. They're still in Golas. In Eretz Yisrael, they're really in Golas Babel, they're really in Golas Paras. Nobody should make a mistake and think, yeah, we've hit it. This is the, you know, Kfar Higiu El Amnucham El Hanachala. Lest somebody think that they had reached Geula Shlema, the Chachamim were noyeg to call the months of the year Babylonian and Persian names. The Chachamim were noyeg that Kla Yisrael would not revert to speaking Lashon HaKodesh. They continued to speak Aramaic. Even when the Chachamim wrote the Talmud, not Talmud Bavli only, even Talmud Yushami, they bedafka wrote it in Aramaic so that Kla Yisrael should realize that they were still in Galas. That means that Galas was worse than this Galas? Ah. It's, a, it's the same Golas. It's the same Golas. But the, we had an ejection 70 years later. We're now waiting uh, 1970 years. The, uh, the, so what we see from here is that without the injection of Tarsha Peh, we would have been lost had that Golas been 71 years. With the Tarsha Peh, 
where we've been able to last this long. In other words, you see what happens to a Jew without adherence to Gezeros Chachamim. Without adherence to the Chachme Yisrael, the Jew disappears in two or three generations. With adherence to the Chachme Yisrael, we last the Netzach Netzachim. Hopefully, hopefully not... Hopefully we'll, we, don't need to, we don't need that injection too much longer. But Rabbi Yaakov says that the Yushalmi wasn't written in, in Aramaic because that's the only language that people understood. He says it was Badafka written in Aramaic to understand, to emphasize the point that we were still in Golas. Says Rabbi Yaakov, when the Chashmonam appointed a king from the Kohanim, even though technically it was against the Halacha, but on the other hand, the Chachamim did not want to speak up and say, you know what, you should really appoint the king from Malchus based David, because that would give the impression that we're going back from Beis HaMikdash, and we're appointing a Melech, and we're ushering in the times of Mashiach. So they, they let it be. They let it be, so that everybody understood this was not the, the, the last era. This was not the Achar Sayyamim. Don't we have to make Shtadjot in order to get to the Yorushlema? I don't know. Yes. I don't know. It's not the case. They did the whole thing. Would have been different. Look, one thing is they knew, the Chachamim back then, they knew the Golas would last for uh, hundreds of years. And they knew the second Beis HaMikdash was not a Gula Shlema. You want to know now, do we need to make a Shtadlus? That's not the subject of today's year. I don't know the answer to that. Look, one thing we know is it says, Tzioin hi doyresh einla, meklal deboi drisha. That you need to be doireshet. You need to seek it out. So the question is, how do you seek it out? Halachically, right? That the Pasuk says, you need to be doireshet the Makam HaMikdash. How are you doireshet the Makam HaMikdash if you're not allowed to go to the Makam HaMikdash? What? Halachically, you know, if we're, we're Tamei Ziva... According to a wrong interpretation of the Pasuk. Okay, just, what? According to a wrong interpretation no, of the No, no, the Ramam already Paskins, you can't go there. But uh, be it as it may, uh, be it as it may, you have to at least desire it in your heart. Now, what that means, Lamaisa, that's not the topic of today's shir. Back to Rabbi Yaakov. Rabbi Yaakov says like this. The reason why the Novi Yecheskel prophecies about the third Beis HaMikdash before the Navi Chagai prophecies about the second Beis HaMikdash is because from the time that the first Beis HaMikdash stood, the eye, the collective eye of the, on the, of the Jewish people was looking forward not to the second Beis HaMikdash. The anticipation and the yearning for the Achras Hayamim was from the time the Navi Yechezkel prophesied about the third Beis HaMikdash. That is the ultimate Geula, that is the utopia, that is the Achras Hayamim that we all look forward to. Why would the Rebbe Shalom, it, second base of Mikdash wasn't even in the cards. It wasn't even in the plan. There was no plan to have a second base of Mikdash. The plan was, Klai Yisrael would go to Babel and hopefully be strong enough and, and uh, endure, have enough endurance to be able to last until the Yimai Samashiach. The Bayashini was like a take two. Was, okay, if it ain't going to work out that you're going to endure the Gullahs for 2,000 years without disappearing, I guess I'm going to have to give you the prophecy of the Navi Chagai that there's going to be a second Beis HaMikdash. But the Navi Chagai was somewhat of an afterthought. It was the third Beis HaMikdash when the Jews in the times of the second Beis... Uh, Lamashal. When the first Beis HaMikdash stood, and they davened, Rivan Shalom, we want the Gula Shlema, they weren't talking about the second base of Mikdash. They always look forward to, to the third base of Mikdash. In fact, I don't have it on the sheet, but the Ramchal writes that we know that base of Mikdash Shalmata is Mechuvan, Keneged, Beis HaMikdash Shalmata, Shenemar, Yusharayim, Harim, Savivla, Yusharayim is Keir, excuse me, that there's an city attached to Yushalayim. That from there we dash So the Ramchal writes, when the Rebbe Shalom destroyed the first base of Mikdash, and the Mikdash Shomala, the first base of Mikdash, was moved, so we don't have a base of Mikdash Shalmata anymore. But immediately when the first Beis HaMikdash Shalmala was removed, the Rebbe Shalom immediately replaced it with the third base of Mikdash Shalmala. Downstairs, we only had second Beis HaMikdash. It was always an incongruous shidduch. But 
from the moment the first base of Mikdash was destroyed, the Mikdash Shalmala was the third base of Mikdash, not the second base of Mikdash. Okay, so says Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, that is the reason why when the Kaihanim appointed a king from the uh, tribe of Levi, the Chachamim did not speak up. Well, here comes one of Rabbi Yaakov's classic uh, ideas, and this is back to the Emes Yaakov and Parshas Shemais. And Rabbi Yaakov uh, was known to be an Ish Emes. He was uh, somebody who personified Midas or Emes. Um, if, if nobody listened to the rabbis in the first place of English, well, who said they didn't listen to the rabbis? Otherwise, you'd still have a base of Otherwise, there'd still be a first base of English. I don't know. Right? We'd, we'd I wasn't there. We'd be currently living in a base of English. Well, I don't know. What do you think that there's ever going to be a third base of English? I don't have to do that. Because God promised us. The davar echad medvarav la yashav reka. He told us. So anyway, the Rabbi Yaakov says like this. The Rabbi Yaakov wasn't make up, making up any stories. The Rebbe Hashem told Kla Yisrael, you're going to be in Mitzrayim 430 years. right? And at the very least, we have explicit psukim that we're going to be there for 400 years. And yet everybody knows we were there 210. So, says Rabbi Yaakov, do you really think that it was all a scam to begin with? That Hashem said 430, and he said 400, but he didn't really mean it. He only meant 210. He meant 400. Shuta Kimashmai. The problem was, in year 209, the Jews were in bad shape. And had we met, if we were going to remain there more than a year more, we would have fallen to the no, point of no return, we would have fallen to the 50th level of Tuma, and we never would have been, get, get, been able to get out. So Hashem tells Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, do me a favor. I promise you're going to be here 400 years. I've got to keep my word. I want you guys going out to the Midbar for three days. You're going to hear lectures from... Uh, from Arachim lectures, you're going to hear Shiurim, you're going to hear the most amazing uh, Devei Torah and the most amazing Shiurim, you're going to recharge your batteries, you're going to bring carbonates for three days, and you're going to be elevated to such a level that you'll be able to withstand another 190 years of Golas. That was the plan. This was not a trick, this was not a scam. It was Pshutei Kemashmoy. Hashem said 400 years. Hashem didn't mean, oh, oh, I'll just count it from the years of Yitzchak. If God says a number, He means the number. The problem was, it wasn't working out. The Jews were sinking fast. So Hashem had to come up with a plan. And that was the plan. And we're going to bring Karbanis, and we're going to come back, and we'll be super strong. The same way the second base Hamikdash gave us fortitude for another 2,000 years, the three days in the Midbar would give them fortitude for another 190 years. The problem was, Paroi said no! So Yom Shem says, look, what do you want from my life? Plan B. I only said 400 years because that's what I meant. Para, if you're going to cooperate. If you're not going to cooperate, then we're going to have to figure out another Eitsa. So plan B is, in the next six months of time, I'm going to have to condense those 190 years with the Vayimaru as Chayim. Either you let them go for three days, or you're going to blow the Holy Arche Kala plan. So what do, you, what do you want from me? I'm going to have to start making calculations. Medale Galaharim, the Kapei Salak voice, and count the 400 years back from the time Yitzchuk was born. I mean, pick your poison. Either you let him go for three days and then you have another 190 years of the Jews in your economy, or we're going to blow up your place in six months from now. So Paroi said no. So Yvonne Shalom said, I don't have a choice. I'm going to have to take everybody out now and condense the, the bitterness, uh, bitterness of the Shibut into the next six months. Says Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, now finally we can understand a pasuk in this week's parasha that all of the Mepharshim struggle with. Let us look at number um, Parak Yod Aleph, Pasuk Aleph. Vayoyimer Hashem El Moshe, Oy nega echad avi el paroi. I have one more nega. Acharechim yeshalach escha mizeh kishalachoy kala goreshi goresh escha mizeh. When I send you out, you're all going out for good. Not temporarily, not a three-day Yarchei Kala, not Nel Chanash, Shloshes Yom Midbar. This time, Paro's not letting you go. Well, we've already condensed the Yemei Shiba in the last six months. This time, you're all going out. L'chalutin, look at number 12. It says Rabbi Yaakov, Kala, Gemira, Kala, Klo, Kol Chamishalach. 
I'm with Varino Lev Harsha Shemoy, Shikasaf the Gavar Tevas Kol Boy Fanacha. Finish him at Chila, the Emes Rotters Brachu, that he would only free them. Sharaki Shachar Oisam was man shall Gimel Yomim, Kadeshi Achoigu Bishviloi Ba Midbar. Avo Mikivan Shaparoi Sirev, because Paroi refused. Omar Kalish Brachu Shakasher Ovi Amatsraim as Hanagom, Oz Yeshalach Eschem Boyfen Shal Kola. This is the meaning, the literal, the simple interpretation of the word kala garish, ye garish eschem. How do they deal with the emotion? What about it? Huh? Yeah, that, I mean, look, the taco of 80% of the Jews, they, they fell pretty low and they, they couldn't make it out. They didn't make it out. No, kala means. Lachalutin, as opposed to temporary. In other words, until now the plan was only to go temporarily, and now the plan is to go permanently. Very interesting, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky says in Parshas B'Shalach that, look in Parag Yudalid, Pasuk Hei, when uh, Mitzrayim realized that, Vayugad Lamech Mitzrayim Kivarach Ha'am, Vayeyofech Levav Pari Vavadam Ha'am, Vayeyom Hazor Zosinu, what do we do? Kishilach Nesis Omei Avdeinu, they said, Oy vey, what do we do? We let them out! I mean, what, you let them out? You don't remember? You just had 10 ma'akos and you told them to go. <laughs> what was the, what, they woke up in the morning. What did we do? What do you mean, what do you do? You basically, you were, you were decimated, so you decided to get them out of here before we all go. <laughs> right? The answer is, we thought now they're only going for three days. What a, now, they, now they see they, they ain't coming back. So they decided to chase after them. Says of Yaakov Kamenetsky, there are patterns in Jewish history. And there are times in Jewish history where the Rav Shem gives a matana, not as a geula, not even as the beginning of a geula. Kla Yisrael sometimes needs a chizok to be able to endure. So we would have had that in the times of Mitzrayim. Pare didn't let. That was what happened in the times of the second Mesa HaMikdash. The second Mesa HaMikdash was not a geula, it was not the beginning of a geula. The second Mesa HaMikdash was what, what's called a pekida. That's why the rabbis did not speak out about the Malche Chashmanam, that's why the Yushalmi was written in Aramaic, so that Klaiso should realize that they're still in Golos. That's why the Tanoim and Amoraim still maintained Aramaic names. That's why Yechezkel prophesied before the Navi Chagai. That's the meaning of the word Kala. That's why they didn't put back the Aroin in the times of the second base of Midrash. Says of Yaakov Kamenetsky, in his opinion, you know, many wonder, what is the role of the state of Israel in Jewish history? Uh-oh. <laughs> And the answer is, nobody knows. That's the answer, because we're not Hashem, only Hashem knows. Is it the key though, or is it Hashem? You know, we have no... We know some people have different opinions about what it is. Rabbi Yaakov once uh, spoke about this publicly, and it's published in his Sefer, that after the period of the Holocaust, and after, really, the religious decimation of Russian Jewry, the Jewish people needed sort of a boost and a shot in the arm. And the concept of the State of Israel says Rabbi Yaakov, was Rabban Shalom giving us a little bit extra chizuk to be able to endure whatever gullus we still have to endure. Now we hope we don't have to endure so much of it like in the times of the second base HaMikdash. But again, there are concepts in history where the Rabban Shalom gives matanoi, or bracha to Klal Yisrael, and the purpose, it, purpose of it is to serve as a shot in the arm to allow us to continue to survive the gullus. So there are patterns. There are three days in the Midbar. There's a period of Abayashani. And there are other matanos and, and benefits Rabbi Hashem bestows upon Klal Yisrael. Says Rabbi Yaakov, this is really an overarching uh, understanding of Tanakh in general, of the episode of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, and should be something to uh, be able to use and put in context the events of Jewish history until Ad Kiyavoy Shiloi You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.